Welcome our listeners to another episode of the Energy Central Power Perspective Podcast. Located in New York City, I'm your host, Jason Price of West Monroe Partners and Community Ambassador for Energy Central. Joining is my colleague, Matt Chester, Community Manager for Energy Central, located in Orlando, Florida. Matt, are you ready for our next guest? Indeed I am, Jason. I'm, I'm excited about today's guest. It, it feels like we get a, a bit of double duty because not only is he a great contributor to Energy Central, he's registered in our official network of experts across the clean power community, the energy efficiency community, and the digital utility community. So I think his insights are going to be really valuable to our listeners. I'm excited as well. However, before we introduce our guests, let's talk about Energy Central. Since 1995, Energy Central has been a trusted news and information source for professionals working in the power industry. Today, Energy Central is more than just a news source. Energy Central is a network of community groups focused on specific topics in the industry. Our managed communities are a place where professionals like you can come together to share, learn, and connect in a collaborative environment. We invite you to become a member if you haven't already and join over 200,000 other professionals working in the power industry. To join, visit www.energycentral.com, and membership is free. Today, we're lucky to have with us Gary Hilberg, a principal of Continuum Energy in Cypress, Texas. In his work, Gary supports the idea that all countries will require significant incremental new energy from multiple sources and technologies. Gary's recent writings on Energy Central is around the area of small modular nuclear reactors. Today, we will get Gary's take on the U.S. appetite for nuclear energy generation and compare this with what he has seen outside the United States. Gary, I'm pleased to welcome you to the Power Perspectives podcast. Thank you, Jason and Matt. Um, I Thanks for the opportunity to be on the podcast. As a listener of the podcast, I'm very excited to participate in the podcast. One of the things that I see as a big gap in the energy segment is the lack of deep, in-depth knowledge of both our participants, our fellow members of our community, and our, you know, all the folks around us. And I think opportunities like this podcast and Energy Central give us a chance to gain a deeper understanding of some of the complex topics. Again, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you very much. Great. We appreciate that. Before we begin, let me say a few words about your impressive career in the energy field. Gary is a chemical engineer and an MBA. He has served on various management teams in the energy sector, including recognizable names like TAS Energy, Pratt & Whitney, GE, and the U.S. Navy, to name a few. Since 2014, he has served as president of Continuum Energy. Gary is also a member of the Energy Central community, and his many posts and comments have resulted in over 18,000 views of his work on the Energy Central platform. Gary, explain for us what is a small modular nuclear reactor and why the sudden interest we're seeing in North America? Well, Jason, um, in this case, the name provides a good oversight. Um, you have lots of different definitions, but in general, small by many definitions, including the International Atomic Energy Agency, is about 300 megawatts electrical output. Um, that's not fixed or firm, but that's one of the definitions. Um, I think modular is probably the most critical part of the definition. And what they're saying here is very similar to the concept of most of our current energy infrastructure. The complex portions of this technology are built in factories off-site um, where costs and quality can be controlled and repeated. Currently, most nuclear power plants are mega scale, over a thousand megawatts electrical per block. and Almost all of the work is performed on site, leading to a lot of complexity and cost overruns. One of the big issues for nuclear power, different than most of the um, other power generation technologies, is the various levels of regulation, not only the traditional energy regulatory issues, but obviously the nuclear regulatory um, folks here in the U.S., and they, they perform tremendous numbers of safety inspections, which are very, very valuable and important but it also can lead to a lot of delays in the field and performing those type of inspections and tests in a factory can really reduce the the timeline and the cost of these. That's sort of the modular concept. So overall, the idea would be this reduces the time and expense of the construction period of these facilities. So I think you asked now, why now in North America? 
So I think reality in North America is we have not built a significant number of nuclear power plants in the last 20 years. Um, the one site that has gone into um, construction, which is Southern Company's Vogel plant in Georgia, it is massively over budget and way over scheduled time. So they're having tremendous issues with it. Um, the Depending on when you pick the target budget period, it is either four, two to four times over budget and would have um, drowned most companies at over $20 billion of investments. So I think the answer is people believe that their nuclear power adds value because we need baseload power in all, in all environments. But we also know that we, we can't continue to build plants for over $10,000 a kilowatt hour install cost. Interesting. Where else is this being developed? And is the commercial viability really there, or will we see this become a heavily subsidized technology? Well, I think the answer, answer to that question is um, there are developers, you know, and this, and this is the interesting part about it, is there's always been companies like Westinghouse, General Electric, Hitachi, Rolls-Royce, who have been the, and, and several other international suppliers, have been the technology suppliers that, that bring nuclear technology to these plants. The change here is that they're bringing a much more complete solution to the um, field. So you're seeing a different breed of, of manufacturers. Some of them, some of the big players, GE has a joint venture with Hitachi that has got a 300 megawatt downsized version of their major scale. Um, there are some new players out there. One of the one, the one that is most advanced in North in the U.S. is um, a company called New Scale out of Oregon, and it is a um, now owned by Floor, the big construction company, engineering construction company, and they've spent what they claim is almost a billion dollars going through um, regulatory approvals. So they're well invested in it, and um, it seems like a, they're very far along. They should gain um, their final U.S. Um, nuclear Regulatory Commission approval in September, which would allow them to go out to the field and um, get specific projects approved. They're, all of these users are talking to um, various countries, a lot of Eastern European countries that have very, very large coal, installed coal base, Poland, Czechoslovakia. They are all looking at small modular reactors because they're very um, excited by the opportunity. So there's a lot of international interest. South Korea, um, which has very few um, native fuel sources, they're a big user of nuclear power and are looking for the next generation of nuclear reactors. So, so I think it's a worldwide phenomena. The only place that's really building a, a significant number of large traditional scale nuclear power plants is China. They, they commissioned almost four gigawatts of nuclear power last year. So they're on scale to build a lot of these plants. You know, China's energy usage is growing by 50 gigawatts a year. So it's a small percentage of their additional growth, but it is a significant percentage. So I think functionally, um, it's, a, it's a big opportunity internationally and in the U.S. Um, as to the metrics on um, subsidization, I think um, there are going to be many subsidies. There already are significant subsidies at the development level, as with most energy sources. The U.S. Department of Energy has a number of programs to incentivize both individual fuel technologies, which could apply to modular reactors, but they have a very specific modular nuclear reactor certification support program. This is started in 2012, and New Scale was one of the applicants for it and the only applicant that actually received those grants. Now, these are cost-matching grants, so they had to put up hundreds of millions. For every dollar the DOE put in, they had to put in a certain number of dollars. So um, I think DOE put in just over $200 million into that effort. So I think, you're yes, you're seeing government subsidies. Um, the, the big subsidies are interesting in the power business. What we've seen a lot of subsidies in the power business you're probably aware of is these loan guarantees, truthfully, loan guarantees rarely cost the government much because in most cases, these loans don't fail. So, for example, the, the Southern Company's project in Vogel has a tremendous billions of dollars of loan guarantees. Now, it won't. it is beneficial to the project because they get cheaper financing because of the government backing. But in most cases, these loan guarantees do not um, fail. So if they do fail, yes, it would cost the government hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. So I would suspect that um, some of these projects will get loan guarantees, although I don't know the specific program. The first project in the U.S. looks like it could be a new scale project with a Utah Associated Municipal Power System, which is a, a, um, a regional power generation organization that generates power for a number of smaller 
of distribution companies throughout Utah and Idaho. And that location is actually targeted to be um, west of Idaho Falls at the Idaho National Labs, which is a very, for anybody in the um, nuclear program, very well known. I actually did my nuclear training out there many years ago. There used The Navy used to have three or four live reactor test reactors where we did training and testing on them. So the area is very supportive of, um, of the um, technology. Um, New Scale is proposing, uh, proposing a 12, 12 unit site out there with their 60 megawatt block. So you could get you know, close to um, 500 megawatts. And the DOE is committed to using one of those blocks for testing. So in that case, DOE is still paying for one of the units and therefore supporting them. So, so yes, there will be a lot of government support. The idea is that you would have a US industry they can del- generate the job and the technology to sell worldwide. That's the hope with this modular factory built technology. So I think there's a, um, a good opportunity for um, obviously America and the technology and jobs. Um, the challenge is that in the US, our, our power markets are not very well structured for long term investment anymore. And because of the problems we've had with previous nuclear power plants, I would suspect it'll take many years for a public utility commission, any state to approve a regulated utility building a nuclear power plant in the rate base. So it'll be a challenge um, early on. So that'll, it'll be interesting to see how the guarantees can support that. Gary, it sounds like uh, SMRs could be a solution to a lot of the economic criticism that nuclear power has faced recently. But I'm curious if you think it'll do anything to sway the opinion of people who are concerned about issues with nuclear power like safety or waste management is is there any uh new developments there that that might help you know sway the court of public opinion i I think those anti-nuclear folks on the way far end of this spectrum won't be swayed by anything Um, most of us that have been involved in nuclear power for for many years recognize that overall it's it's it has remained one of the safest solutions out there obviously we've had some major issues um, so that actually has developed some some reasonable public fear in, in very specifically, the small nuclear reactors have a lot of very um, advanced safety features, which make them much safer than previous designs. The number one design is almost every one of these um, have uh, natural circulations built into them, which means they will continue to cool themselves, whether they have electricity or not. The new scale product for one does not use any mechanical pumps at any t- point of operation. And they they have a, um, a design life that will show how that plant will go from full power with the producing full power all the way to literally three years away without needing any human interaction to solve the problems. They actually sit in a, a big tank of water. All, t- all 12 modules will sit in one big tank. And so there's a tremendous number of, of safety features associated with them. The U.S. Department of Energy has done a lot of work and they've come out with safer fuel that's rated to higher temperature. So it's less likely to melt down like happened at Three Mile Island. So there's a tremendous number of safety factors that have been implemented in these designs and um, and certainly the advances in technology that you got to remember most every reactor in the U.S. was designed in the 70s and 80s and not much has changed. Obviously, Vogel has newer digital controls, but, you know, it's not. And, and, and so it'll it'll come online as the newest plant. But the previous plant before Vogel was a TVA plant that was not was commissioned about 10 years after it was completed. So, we, like I said, we're most of our, our nuclear reactors in this country are older units. They have older technologies, but they are implementing these newer, newer features. So, yes, the answer to the question is, yes, the, the technology is much improved and much, much safer. And in addition to that, the scale, the smaller scale of these reactors, and particularly since a lot of them are very small modules, instead of 1,000 megawatt reactors, you're looking at hundreds of megawatts. The potential um, danger of one of those units having a problem is really mitigated just by volume. One of the the studies that's done by General Electric Hitachi, you know, did some very clear articulation that the the footprint per megawatt was down by, you know, more than half, maybe even, you know, 80 percent because of the of the design scale. So, so yes, there's a lot of um, safety factors there. On the economics, um, when when these mega plants were built, the economics were targeting, and, and the historical economics in, in U.S. nuclear runs about 
sixty dollars um, a megawatt hour, which isn't great compared to you know some people will point out that we can get solar for twenty five dollars. But I think most of us that are in the in energy industry realize that um, it's very very expensive to move megawatts. As we all know, you know electricity has to be used, instant it's generated. So functionally having a solid carbon free base load to cover all of those things that run 24 hours a day. There's really no other source of non-fossil fuel generation that is base load. Everything else we have, hydro, wind, solar, is intermittent. So this is the one opportunity we have to, to grow that base load and, and make sure that we don't have to over install storage solutions to move some of that less consistent generation capacity. Um, to, to sort of answer the targets that these these customers these most of the small modular reactor folks are quoting numbers in the three thousand to four thousand dollars per kilowatt op, kilowatt installed. You know, Vogel is close to ten thousand dollars. So obviously that that's not a good example because it's been such a challenge project. But it's the only example we have. I don't know what the Chinese reactors have been installed for. I would suspect they're closer to the three to four thousand just based on lower labor costs. Gary, there's been a lot of uh, talk about molten salt nuclear reactors. Is this modular model applicable to the molten salt types of reactors? Um, <laughs> I am. Um, I've not seen a modular nuclear reactor using molten salt. Um, molten salt was very, very not very, very common. It was um, as a as a submarine officer, I. We saw molten re salt reactors, and I think the Navy had one of them, the Sea Wolf, but they moved away from them due to operational complexities in the 60s, 50s and 60s. The Russians had a, several of them, and the real advantage of molten salt was power density. Um, obviously, power density on land isn't nearly as important as power density in a, in a mobile environment. Um, there's a lot of other factors associated with it, but I think the um, there are a couple of molten salt technologies out there. I'm not an expert on that. I've not seen any recent desires to do it. Um, I think that the key problem that we have in all power generation technologies is that we have to make these commercial. So the best technology may not be the most financeable technology. So I think I think functionally that's one of the sort of the, the balancing acts we have to keep in mind is that we really have to do things at scale and um, will molten, molten salt scale. Um, I don't I can't comment. I don't. I don't. I don't have the technology advantage of it. But I've not seen. It's not like you can. At least in the U.S., I can walk around and see 100 light water reactors operating. And and you know, I had the staffs of 100 light water reactor reactors that could come on and run some different type of light water reactor, which is very very similar. So so I think I think that's one of the challenges with commercialization. How many changes do you want to make to a technology before you go try to get a a bank to finance it? And the answer I think most of us know is not very many. No. Yeah. Gary, you mentioned the TVA. Uh, what's going on with the TVA and how this how could this be applicable? Well, so it's interesting if you look at, and it's all very public information, if you look at the um, Nuclear Regulatory um, Commission's website, you can see everybody who's making applications and progressing applications for new reactor technologies. Unfortunately, in, for the business, it's a very short list. Um, the TVA actually came out with an interesting site application. They came out and said that they were they're progressing an application to get approval to install a, a, a new reactor at a specific site. And one of the interesting concepts that I'm not fully qualified to discuss, but I will, I've, I've heard conversation about is these smaller plants require a lot um, smaller um, control area for the plant, which is an area that you have to notify people if there's a problem. So ideally, what, what the technology is trying to do is reduce that control area so it will they won't have to buy as much land or have, impact as many people when they install them. So TVA has picked a specific site and started a, a an application process. They've not generated a lot of information and not been willing to say which technology they would apply to that site. But it would be the opportunity for one of the small modular reactor um, suppliers to you know match up their desire to install equipment with a utility customers desire to to use the equipment obviously they don't have they've got the funding to do the site analysis but they don't have the funding to do the um to install the project i think this is a good opportunity for our users to always think about what why would somebody be interested in it. if i'm tva 
which is in a state that has very poor wind profile. The solar profile is a bit average. They just came across with a multi-billion dollar PUC request. They've got a, a rate case out looking for approval of a, of a massive solar and storage solution to displace some of their coal. They're a very, very large operator of coal plants. And they're also a very, very oper large operator of nuclear plants. A lot of their nuclear plants have got um, lots of years left on their license you know, 30 to 50 years left in their license. So they'll be operating new plants for a long time. But they also realize that their customer base is demanding carbon-free energy. So they're doing the smart thing, in my opinion, you know, covering their bases. They've, they've done a good job of adding um, um, combustion turbines, advanced combustion turbines. But again, many people in the marketplace don't see that as a, um, as a 50-year solution. So I think, I think what they're doing is sort of progressing the opportunity to put these units down and keep their, you know, their workforce and their customers getting that carbon free energy throughout the long term. So. Let's switch gears for a moment. Let's talk about some of your writings on Energy Central. Three of your last four postings were nuclear related, but the fourth was about zinc air batteries. Can you tell us more about this? So um, one of the very interesting aspects of, of um, energy storage is that um, we're all very, very familiar with um, lithium ion batteries. There's a lot of um, issues with lithium iron associated with, you know, duration of storage and a lot of other issues. But so zinc air is a technology that is a, more like a flow battery. It has a, um, a conversion um, center that will establish how many kilowatts or megawatts it can discharge. But um, it, um, it then has a storage tank of a chemical that allows it to react and then store or um, produce energy. Um, the, one of the big va value propositions of zinc air is it does not use any of the high value minerals that current bat battery technology is using, and it claims to have limited or no fire risk. So if that is a true proposition, that, that puts it in a very, very interesting um, position of saying that it could, um, be very, very competitive in the stationary storage um, aspect. The operational profile of a zinc air battery is uh, more like a flow battery where it doesn't, you know, uh, charge and discharge very, very quickly. It may be much more for a longer duration. Interesting, just this week, I saw another, um, another release from a, a second Canadian zinc air flow battery that is claiming that they have a pilot project in New York that they're claiming at $45 per kilowatt hour which is lower than you know, the $150 to $200 for zinc ion. Now, what they need to do is they need to be long duration. So they're, all they have to do is add more tank storage for their, their liquid component of, their, of their, their system. So I think, I think the interesting part about zinc air storage, the reason I'm interested in it is that if you're really looking to have a 8 to 10 to 12 or even longer st um, storage duration, you can do it much more cost effectively with more of a flow battery solution, and this flow battery solution, Zinc Air, seems to have a much better, I'm calling it a flow battery, it may not technically be a flow battery, but it looks a lot like one, but this seems to have a lot of good cost points. A lot of the other flow batteries have some equally challenging components. I've seen one with hydrogen, there's a lot of vanadium, and you know, so there's a lot of different weird chemistries associated with flow batteries that, that may not be any nicer than lithium ion. But that's why I'm interested in it. I think it's a, um, it, it, it could be an opportunity for us to really push the, the cost effectiveness of, of a long duration renewable resource that may not be as um, you know, timely as, as we want it to be. Gary, do, do you have a sense of the timeline for something like a zinc air battery to become commercially available? You know, what are the, the particular challenges that, that need to be overcome? I mean, you, you talked about the economics, but you know, what are people working on before getting over that hump? Well, I think I think I mean it, this is what's sort of exciting about the industry now. One of the, one of the as an um, old school you know power guy that's been around since the 90s, the the dynamic nature of this industry is interesting. I remember five years ago when we first started talking about lithium ion, the big question was, well, no one's ever going to install a megawatt or two megawatts of lithium ion because we don't know what the life cycle is. So now five years later, you can go out and get a, you know, a, a warranty for multi years with a, a, a degradation from a major supplier. 
So I, I think what you're going to need to get, this is the article today that um, I reposted on Energy Central was about a New York project where it's a three-year prototype um, um, system. So I think after three years, you're going to start to see some proof that this technology will have the life cycle. A lot of these, um, I did some work with flow battery um, park supplier a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of the flow batteries had some significant life cycle breakdowns in some of their membranes. And there's a lot of tech, um, work going on. How do you can extend the life of these car, um, these car, I think they were carbon membranes and um, things like that. So there's a, there was a lot of technology work being done on their anodes or membranes and things like that. So I think what you're gonna have to have is a little bit of time making sure that this technology actually can do what the manufacturers have it. And they'll do some longevity tests that sort of try to accelerate the longevity, but you're not gonna get somebody to invest in what they think is a 15 or 10 or 15 year asset on the backs of one three month trial. So I think we're gonna need time. And I think the funding may be there for some, some trials. Um, the biggest challenge I see it with um, batteries and one of the biggest advantage lithium ion has is that the automobile, um, the EVs have really, really given the, the cycle durations um, experience to the stationary battery industry. And we rarely get that in the, in the energy industry. We rarely get some other technology. We got a little bit in aero derivative gas turbines where you could take the big jet engines and compare them to the, you know, the, the, the Pratt & Whitney and General Electric stationary engines and Rolls-Royce engines, the Trents and the LM6000. But in this case, the energy storage industry, the lithium ion battery has the stationary energy storage portion of lithium ion has really, really benefited from the massive construction of EVs and the comfort level that people have with them. So it's an interesting dynamic that that I don't think that unfortunately Zinc Air will get. They're going to have to you know, build their case on the backs of stationary energy storage only. Gary, tell us uh, what you what are you looking at, at at Continuum Energy? What are you working on? What kind of projects you uh, focused on, and and what are you thinking about at Continuum Energy? Well, I'm, I'm, I'll make one plug for it. One of my big my big focus points is this energy education. Um, I speak to um, I, I've, I've been speaking. I went to Oregon State. I speak to the engineering um, classes there um, periodically. I'm a big fan of that. That's what I love about Energy Central. The opportunity to bring some, you know deeper thinking to the energy segment. I'm, that's a big passion of mine. So I do as much of that as I can. So I love doing that. So thank you for letting me do that on this session. On the project side, um, one of the areas is microgrids. Um, and, you know, people say, what's a microgrid? A microgrid generally is a, is a collection of energy assets, has to have some sort of generation and usage that can operate in an isolated manner from the main grid. Um, you can have non-grid connected microgrids, but um, most of what I'm looking at is, is, is grid connected microgrids. And what this does, it gives the opportunity for a lot of these new distributed energy resources. We always think of the renewable ones, but there's a tremendous number of other ones, you know, higher efficiency recip engines, small CHP plants with gas turbines or recip engines, um, any sort of generation source that can sit on primarily commercial industrial sites non-utility scale. So you're talking hundreds of megawatts to you know, hundreds of kilowatts to, to megawatts, not you know hundreds of megawatts. And then you have a control system that allows um, safe connection to the grid. You have a, a, a grid disconnect breaker that can synchronize to the grid. And then the control systems today are, are fabulous and they allow, allow an operator to, to um, proactively start up their backup units and keep them synchronized to the grid, but not disconnect from the grid as they see weather conditions or utility alerts that would say, wait a minute, our, our grid may have problems. So maybe you're in, in, a, um, in, a, in the south where we get these big lightning strikes that can cause substations to blow up. You can, you can automatically have your system start starting up the generators. And then when the grid goes away, it can safely disconnect your, your load from the grid, run on an isolated grid, and then reconnect to the grid without shutting down your loads in between. So you can you, you can leverage existing backup generators that you may have that previously needed you to be disconnected from the grid to operate. You can do a lot of interesting stuff like that and really improve your your system's reliability and redundancy, um, and re resilience, um, and also be able to push more renewable resources or maybe low carbon resources to the grid. If maybe you're running a high efficiency CHP plant, you may be able to burn a lower cost natural gas fuel and push, um, you know, megawatts to the grid when you don't need them on site. 
So it's a really exciting technology. It's been around for a long time, but the technologies and availability of storage, you know, mainly lithium ion batteries and distributed resources, um, solar PV is a very popular one, allows you to bring you know, some pretty competitive power prices and additional resiliency to customers that may, may have not been able to use it before. Gary, given your wide and deep knowledge in the, in, in the energy field, we're going to have to get you on the show again. Uh, I want to thank you again, Gary Hilberg, Principal of Continuum Energy. You can always reach Gary through the Energy Central platform, where he welcomes your questions and comments. I also want to thank our contributing partners of Energy Central, ESRI, the Environmental Systems Research Institute. ESRI is an international supplier of geographic information, GIS software, WebGIS, and geodatabase management applications. To Guidehouse, formerly Navigant, a leading global provider of consulting services to the public and commercial markets with expertise in energy, sustainability, and infrastructure. To Oracle Utilities, providing best-in-class utilities management solutions to improve reliability, service, and safety for the electric, water, and natural gas companies. To Atonix Digital, a Black & Veatch company. Atonix Digital software helps companies simplify asset performance management by putting data to work. And lastly, to Bentley Systems, a software development company that supports the professional needs of those responsible for creating and managing the world's infrastructure projects. Once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping onto the community at energycentral.com and see you next time at Energy Central's Power Perspectives podcast.